Hello and welcome to Youth Voice Homeless Parliament 2020. It's been a crazy year and some crazy times. Throughout it all, we've all stayed close to the team and supportive as a group. The care we've given each other over the last few months has been priceless and wholesome to us all. Unfortunately, all of our tremendous team can't be here due to the unseen circumstances, but here's a quick run through of us all. We have Aston, Jody, Thelma, Joanne, Archie, Brittany, Renee, Kyle, Emily, Becky, Christina, Kane, Connor, Naomi, Ben, Marvin, Lamisha, Morgan, Summer, and Devin. And from YMCA, we have Declan. From Roundabout, we have Christy, Aaron, and Keisha. From Forum Housing, we have China and Adele. And from DePaul, we have Declan and Simone. From Youth Homeless Northeast, we have Jack, Yussi, and Ruth. So there's the talent. Now we're going to share some of our personal experiences and suggestions with you. Thank you for watching and let's begin. Welcome to Youth Homeless Parliament 2020. I'd like to welcome all to the Youth Homeless Parliament 2020. I'd like to begin by thanking on behalf of all Youth Homeless Parliament members today, Minister Kelly Tolhurst, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Rough Sleeping and Housing. I'd like to introduce you to my peers from across England that are here today that make up the Youth Homeless Parliament. There are many reasons that bring us here today, but there are a few similar themes. We all have a passion to make things better for the future, and we all have dreams, goals and aspirations for the future. For myself personally, as a young child I witnessed my father sleeping in a doorway, covered in snow, and from that day my passion grew to help the homeless. I could never have imagined that I'd become one of those people with nothing to my name when I received support from a youth homeless organisation when I was 17. Having experienced plenty of trauma, I'm actively working hard to repair it myself and improve my mental health whilst pursuing studies towards biology and environmental sciences at Newcastle College and Newcastle University. This is my experience. I stand proud and all the Youth Homeless Parliament members are so humbled to be the faces who represent thousands of young homeless people across England. Each of us have individual experiences with homelessness and sharing this can be difficult. Please appreciate that each young person sharing their experience needs to be more than heard and we welcome action and partnership to bring about change. The 2020 Youth Homeless Parliament seeks to build on the recommendations from last year's report. Last year's report sought to consider responses from a large number of young people who had experienced homelessness and many of the topics continue to be a concern for young people. For the 2020 Youth Homeless Parliament, it was agreed to deep dive into the experiences of young people, exploring in depth some of these similar experiences. Through exploring our lived experiences with one another, we were able to extract reoccurring problems, making recommendations from our own experiences that would improve services for other young people. These recommendations seek to avoid young people becoming homeless in the first place, but also make the experience for young people who find themselves homeless to be less traumatic. We will present the challenges we face, share a lived experience and offer recommendations in six areas. First, early intervention. Second, supported accommodation. Third, mental health and well-being. Fourth, further and higher education, five, benefits and work, six, post-independent support. Thank you. Topic one, early intervention, the challenges. We felt there was a lack of recognition of the signs of potential homelessness, which stopped people acting quickly to either prevent the problem or reduce them. For a lot of young people, family breakdown was a the reason they were made homeless with some of us left out of conversations around issues like family homes being repossessed. There was also a failure in schools to talk about issues like mental health and homeless support. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Connor Rogerson, who lives in Grimsby. Growing up, me and my mum had a strong relationship, but when I started college, things started to go wrong, which resulted in mine and my mum's relationship changing. It wasn't the same as before. 
I made a bad decision at home and she kicked me out for a while and I begged her to let me come back, but not long later, she kicked me out again. There was no support anywhere. I felt so lost and needed a way out. If there was some intervention at this time, maybe things would not have gone the way they did. I moved to a new college and finally managed to speak to a member of staff and I got an immediate referral for YMCA. I thought I was never gonna see mum or sister again. I cried on the first night and as the weeks went on, I started making some more bad choices. I knew if my mum found out, she would disown me and never speak to me again. I then decided to stop that and focus on what I needed to do in life, which was getting to some sort of further education or a gateway to a career. So I knuckled down with college and got help from my support worker. Me and my mum's relationship started to improve. We would see each other every week and we'd spend the day together with my sisters too, which gave me more to look forward to. I love running and signed up for half marathons and I volunteered for the YMCA, which helped my confidence grow. I finished college with fantastic grades and I knew that I wanted to go to university. So I decided to take a full year out and work full time to save money. What I've learned from my past experience is that if you ever have any problems with family, you need to get support. But for me, there was no interventions that could support me or my mum. There should be more services for family intervention when the signs start to appear. There should be support there straight away if there are any signs of family breakdown which could lead to homelessness, even if it's access to more temporary accommodation or just support to help homeless young people get on the right direction. I strongly believe there should be more support within schools and colleges. As for me, when I was at my first college, there wasn't that much support regarding family breakdown. However, at the time, I was too shy to speak and get any support when I needed it the most. Early intervention, our recommendations. We recommended that schools are trained to spot the potential signs of homelessness and talk to young people about where to go for support so that they are prepared. We also believe organisations that support young people who are homeless should treat each young person as an individual, looking at their needs and strengths that will allow them to continue with positive aspects of their lives, like their support network. Thank you. Topic two. Support and accommodation. We recognise that support and accommodation is a lifeline for young homeless people and most of us have had good experiences, but some of us didn't. And there were inconsistencies with the support and antisocial behaviour within support accommodation that wasn't tackled adequately. So more vulnerable residents were preyed on by other residents and taken advantage of. Along with a lack of security measures in some centres, this made people feel unsafe. I'll be reading for Declan Manion from Manchester. I was staying in some supported accommodation, but was given notice to leave after being accused of something that I didn't do, and was told there was no point appealing the decision, as, if, as they felt like the staff knew best and they didn't want to listen to my point of view. A misjudgement from a worker led to me being kicked out. So the story goes. After being out with some friends, I went back to my flat and decided to do some laundry. I had to go and check on it every half an hour, but it was the early hours, so I never saw anyone else in the corridor. I was just chilling out in my flat between checking on my washing when I noticed the front door open and quickly close. There was one security guard who was known for letting themselves in randomly for no reason into people's flats but I never saw who it was behind the door. I thought it was weird, but finished my washing and went to bed, thinking nothing of it. I wake up the next day to the staff calling me down and giving me a notice to quit. They said the security guard had seen me smoking weed in my flat. I wanted to peel as it wasn't me. I never smoked weed in my flat and had never gotten a warning for drugs in the 10 months that I'd been there. But I heard a neighbour has given has been given three warnings just this month. This felt like they were targeting me and the security guards seemed to have it in for other mixed race and black residents also. After leaving there, I went to another organisation and was put in different supported accommodation. This place has been good. It's more relaxed, more personal, the supported staff aren't so overworked and it feels like actual support not a meeting between staff and a service user. Our recommendations for supported accommodation. We feel there should be a set of standards developed for supporting housing that recognises the importance of safety and security, as well as residents' concerns listened to and acted on. These standards should be developed 
in in consultation with young people. So there is a balance between privacy and places where people can socialise so they don't become isolated. We also felt it was important that young people are able to stay near their existing support networks, connections and education facilities as well as work. This was something we all thought was important but this is also something which needs to be considered more in rural places. Topic 3. Mental health and wellbeing. The challenges. Many of us shared similar stories about having a tough childhood, falling out with families, parents dying or having lived in the care system, which meant that we become homeless often dealing with all this while suffering with anxiety, depression and other diagnosed mental health issues. As well as having no home, which is scary and stressful enough, a lot of us had to deal with other traumatic things like why we were made homeless or difficult circumstances and emotions on top of mental health issues. Hi, my name is Cale McGillan. I'm 23 from Newcastle. Um, and there's two main points in my story about mental health and I look back. Um, the first one, I broke my arm and my granddad died. Um, and then later on, the loss of my daughter due to miscarriage. Um, about my arm, it was a pretty bad break. Nearly lost um, the arm from the elbow down due to nerve damage. Um, and unfortunately, I had to go to London for an operation. Um, my granddad paid for these tickets um, for me to go to London. But... Before I could come back and say thank you and how much I appreciated it, um, unfortunately he passed away. Um, and when something like that happens and someone like that dies in your family, you know you can see that they're blatantly the glue of the family. They're the ones that are keeping it all together. Um, and that was obvious, standing at the funeral, looking around, realising that really no one was coming up to me and my sisters and my brothers asking us if we were alright. Everyone was just kind of asking everyone else really. Um, and that's when I kind of started to see my family fall apart in front of us. Um, after that, there was an agreement between me and my pair, well, me and my mom, sorry, um, that I would sleep in my bed, but that was about it. Um, I wouldn't be allowed back between the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. Um, so it was a time when having poor mental health was kind of frowned upon, um, and there wasn't many services to turn to. Um, or people in general to speak to. Um, so I ended up turning to drugs. There wasn't much else to do. When you're kind of feeling that pain, you kind of need something to plug the hole, I guess. Um, and then a few years later, me and my now ex-girlfriend um, found out that we were pregnant. Um, very stressful, but a very happy time. Um, but unfortunately, Due to the fact that our families didn't quite get on and we well, had lots of disagreements within our own families about each other, um, a lot of stress was put on us and unfortunately stress can be one of the worst things you can go through. Um, and Unfortunately, my ex-girlfriend lost our daughter due to stress um, and the stress put on her by both of our families. Um, so even when we went to the hospital and we spoke to the hospital about it, you know, there wasn't anything after that. It was kind of, okay, yeah, your daughter's now gone. You need to kind of deal with that. See you later. Um, on to the next one, I guess, really. Um, and then about a year later, two years later, maybe, I got back with my ex. Um, and we both had an argument, in, like, with my mother about, um, the fact of that she just didn't really care enough um, and in the worst way possible probably she kind of just said okay I don't care about you and I don't care about your daughter it's not my problem she's not my granddaughter you deal with that whatever um, and to be fair my daughter never did anything wrong she was never given the chance um, for the moment in the hospital when the doctor said your daughter's no longer alive and with you, I probably never felt lower. You know, I was losing my family, my like my whole family. I was losing my brothers and my sisters, um, and my support network that I had relied on to some extent for so long, um, and having to navigate such difficult situations of being homeless and trying to put on a brave face, like there really does need to be more for young people in their hardest and darkest times, 100%. Mental health and well-being are recommendations. Um, we feel there needs to be more of a focus on preventing bad mental health um, within children. There needs to be more qualified mental health workers in schools. 
and in supported accommodation um, because they'll be able to spot signs within young children, 11, 12, 13 years old, of mental health and be able to put a stop to it and help them straight away. And it means that young people are getting support there and then they can deal with what needs to be dealt with and not having to deal with stuff three or four or five years down the line when they're trying to sit GCSEs, A-levels, go to university because that's when it really will ruin their lives. When you start falling behind your peers and you notice you're starting to fall behind your peers, it does make a big difference and it does have an impact on you for sure. Um, we also want to see a wellness recovery action plan designed for those with mental health problems to fill in gaps between services and ensure that people are on the road to recovery. Like, it's no good being passed from one service to the next service, but that taking three or four months, because in three or four months, you can go from being great and starting to be on the road to recovery to the depths of despair again. And when that happens, and it happens multiple times, you you kind of start giving up and you kind of start feeling well what is the point anymore like why am i here why am i trying like i get so far and then get pushed back so i just feel there needs to be a little something extra in there to kind of to kind of allow people to not fall back and to not go back to square one again and to not feel like they have to give up thank you hello my name is Thelma Sanzanika and I'll be reading Topic 4, Further and Higher Education. The challenges. A lot of us here aspire to further education, but there is a lack of support for self-sufficient young people compared to people from more stable backgrounds. Some of us found it hard to stay in education because we couldn't afford textbooks or travel. Those studying full-time and not eligible for benefits struggled to balance working enough hours and studying. For people going away to university, there is a real problem with returning to homelessness because student accommodation doesn't cover the summer break and we have nowhere to go back to in the holidays. Hardship funds are often a small amount as an emergency. I'll be reading on behalf of Kisha South from Sheffield. Being homeless led me being kicked out of sixth form, not because I did anything wrong, my grades were good, but because the college didn't know how to handle my circumstances. It was like they weren't willing to find solutions and made even simple things harder. Even stuff that wouldn't be a big issue would be made into one. They couldn't understand that I didn't have parents to come to a parents' evening and wanted me to bring a support worker from the hostel, which wouldn't be appropriate. In the end, they gave up and kicked me out. The sixth form that took me in after didn't get it at first, but they found ways to make it work. When I couldn't make it into college because I couldn't afford the bus, they called to check in and offered to send someone to collect me. I felt cared for and they offered to work around me and find practical ways to support me. When they realised no one could come to parents' evenings, they realised I was my own parent and offered to leave it up to me. They even helped when I moved into my own flat. I'm going to university in Leeds in September to do social, to do social care and become a social worker. One of my teachers lent me the money to complete my UCAS applications out of their own pocket. I couldn't have done it without their support. Further and higher education are recommendations. We feel there needs to be extra support for young people who have to be self-sufficient with accommodation being provided for young people who don't have anywhere to go back to in the holidays. We also think more financial support and extra emotional and mental health support should be offered for those who came from disadvantaged backgrounds and may lack the emotional support network available to others. My name is Archie Farouk and I'm going to be talking about the benefits and work, uh, the challenges. A lot of us have similar stories where it feels like the benefit system doesn't want us to contribute. Minimum wage is set at a lower rate for our age group, despite doing the same work as our colleagues. And universal credit provides less incentive for us to work more than a few hours a week. If we do work more, we risk losing 
benefits and having less money than if we didn't work at all, putting us in a worse situation. The balance between trying to live, work, in many cases, stay in full time education is incredibly difficult. Uh, I'm going to be reading for uh, Declan Besto uh, from Stoke on Trend. This month I got the lowest uh, payment for, for universal credit. I'm in full time education and I have a job, but I understand why people don't work. I was a care leaver, but since moving into supported accommodation, I've had to cut my, my hours down to the bare minimum. It's lucky for me that my employers are flexible. I was actually due a pay rise, but I've told them there's no point because it's not really going to benefit me. If I took any more hours, it would affect my universal credit and rent contribution. So no doubt I would be worse off. I had to go about five or six weeks without any financial support whatsoever. I applied to be an ambassador and gave me an ultimatum. So I packed it all in and took the opportunity. It has been fantastic for my self-esteem, the amount of confidence uh, it has given me. I'm actually running a campaign to raise money for charity and I'm seeing people from my past supporting it and making better choices too. But I've made the sacrifices. I was making more in a week than I could now in a month. But even though I was making loads of money, it wasn't worth it. The volunteering roles I've been doing now gives me more satisfaction. I'm studying an access course now at college and I want to go to university in the future. I will actually be, be, be better off because of the student loan and maintenance loan than on university credit. In the future, I would like to do a job where I'm helping people. Benefits and work recommendations. All of us talk about how frustrated we are that we want to fully contribute to a, to a, a society not relying on benefits to live but that often we can't. We would like to see a minimum wage be the exact same amount for everyone, regardless of age, so that we are afforded the same pay as older people doing the exact same job and can support ourselves as the best we can. We would like to see universal credit system change so we are able and encouraged to work, but without being worse off for doing so. We would also like to see supported accommodation rents should be funded differently so we can live, study and work in safe accommodation. With support, we need to thrive and progress. Housing benefit also needs to mirror the cost of private rented accommodation. Thank you. Topic six, post-independent support. Once young people regained the stability required to live independent lives, there's a feeling that there was a lack of support to ensure this continues. There were concerns around the financial costs, like saving for a deposit for accommodation, through to support and information on tenants' rights once young people have moved into accommodation. For some young people, they were also concerned about the lack of support for young parents and their babies, which could potentially be very isolating for young mothers in particular. Next, I have a reading for Renee Thomas. They said, having just left a job to start an access course to work in the NHS, I found out I was pregnant. My grandparents, who I live with, are very religious and told me I couldn't live with them anymore. I tried to leave and was housed by the council, but the property wasn't safe and I felt secluded and didn't know anyone. I had no support and had no real understanding of how to live on my own or my rights as a tenant, let alone coping with my new surroundings. My grandparents let me move back until my baby was born, but I had to move out again when my baby was four months old. This time I was placed in supported housing with other mums and their babies. I didn't really know anyone, but when a new support worker started, they told me about a mum and baby group that met over the road in a church. I would never have known it was there. I really enjoyed going. I went twice a week. It was really nice to speak to other mums. I have now moved into my own flat after having good support. I have the skills and understand how I can manage my own tenancy. 
I'm much happier than the first place. I feel safe and I have a good network around me. I know the area well. My grandparents live down the road and come to visit. Plus the rent isn't high so I've gone back to work. These are our post-independent support recommendations. We would like to see supported accommodation work with tenants to find a way to create a stepping stone between supported and independent living, like ways to fund a deposit. Ongoing floating support for six months after moving into independent accommodation would help things run more smoothly and allow problems to be picked up and tackled before they became larger issues. Welcome packs in social housing to inform young people of their rights and local amenities would be helpful, as would support groups for young people in similar situations, particularly for young parents, to prevent isolation. On behalf of Youth Homeless Parliament members, I would like to thank the Minister for Local Government and Homelessness and the Government for the opportunity to have our voices heard and to share our stories with you. We would ask that experience be taken into account and used to help shape government and policy to improve the lives of young people who are homeless and at risk of being homeless. We hope that our experience will help improve situations so that young people who find themselves at risk of homelessness are prevented from doing so. And those that do are able to access good quality services that will allow them to lead independent lives. We, the Youth Homeless Parliament, would also welcome the opportunity to work with the government to reduce youth homelessness and consult on standards mentioned in this report. Thank you. And there you have it. Heartfelt experiences from our talented team. Thank you so much to everyone who shared with us and expressed their suggestions. And thank you Minister Kelly Tolhurst for listening to our personal experiences. We hope that today you've seen what we're all about and that our experiences have moved you as they've moved us. We may be a small group, but we are strong, diverse and motivated to spread our message so that one day youth homelessness can be simply a myth. One day, every young person will know where they can go if they're afraid of becoming homeless. One day, there will be services and support available that everyone can access. And one day, we will live in a world where people are treated as people and not as what life has thrown at them. Help us make our dream come true. Thank you. Now let's watch some of the bloopers. <coughs> Sorry, Marvin. <laughs> the challenges. Sorry, Marvin. <laughs> You're gonna have to edit this video so much, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sweaty top lip. What I've learned from my past experience. <coughs> you know what, we're starting this again anyway. This felt like... I'm oh, sorry again, sorry. Once young people regained the... It's a bit... Once young people regained the... Oh my god. Once young people re... Thank you. <laughs>